RVB Season 12 is a bit of a step up from the drag that was Season 11, although that really isn't saying a whole lot. But they did make steps to improve. For instance, they brought back animation, this time held by Chris Dyke, as Monty was well into Ruby at this point. And with the storyline that was set up at the end of the last season, things can only look up from that, right? We open up with Caboose, Griff, and Simmons leading a training exercise, which looked like the first legitimate military exercise they've ever been a part of. But in typical red and blue fashion, things go completely to hell the minute they see the enemy. To quote another show, they've got a long way to go before they're ready to save anybody. I hope Tucker has it better than this. No, as we find out, he's not, because he's on an actual mission with Felix, the celluloid chlamydia of Red vs. Blue. Tucker wants to sneak into the base and steal data to find out where Wash and the others are being kept so that they can finally get their friends back. And Felix just wants to blow the place up without getting the valuable data that could be beneficial to the war effort because he's an explosion-happy fuckwit. Luckily, Reason wins out. Ah, here's the problem. The rats must have chewed through the wire. That is a military-grade reinforced power cable. What kind of rats are you talking about? Firstly, what about the ROUSs? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. Tucker pulls a hitman to outfit his soldiers in enemy uniforms that conveniently fits his two soldiers, infiltrates the base, and captures the soldier and gets the intel. He's like, this close to being competent here. In fact, I think he might have actually pulled the whole thing off if not for... Now. Oh, shit. Oh, this fucking scene. Remember how I said last time that Locust was the most terrifying being in RVB? Well, this scene cemented it for me. For a moment, even though I knew Tucker would get out alright, I was legitimately terrified he was going to get caught. Everything goes to shit, Felix blows the bombs, killing Rogers, and the surviving three retreat. Back at base, Griff tells a story about how they took down the meta. What I love about this scene is that he doesn't even need to exaggerate. What he tells them is exactly how it happened, bit for bit. Which is actually kind of impressive that the story by itself is still legend enough to tell to these wide-eyed recruits. Kimball informs the group that they have the information on their missing teammates' location, but the group is going to be moved within the week, and after that, it's going to be like finding a needle in the fail the needles. So the only solution is to assemble a special operations team to infiltrate the base and get the others out. I would just like to remind you all, as if you need a reminding, that our current group of heroes includes a kiss-ass, a pervert, the laziest man in the world, and a guy whose IQ is so low, Lenny from Of Mice and Men looks like a genius by comparison. Yeah, if I was planning on putting together a top secret team to go against what is essentially the galactic empire of this planet, this would not be my A-team. I'm thinking something more along the lines of, oh yeah. So they assemble a team of four of the unluckiest bastards in the New Republic, Bitters, voiced by Brandon Farmahini, Smith, voiced by Ryan Haywood, Jensen, voiced by Jackie Mid I mean Barbara Dunkelman, and Paloma, voiced by Carrie Shawcross. These four are really just meant to be younger versions of the main group. Bitters is lazy and pessimistic, Smith is proud but a little bit certifiable, Jensen likes order and looks up to her commanders, and Palomo... Um... Well, he... I don't know, he doesn't act like Tucker all that much, so he, um... Uh... Huh. And because nothing can be easy, they next have to figure out who's going to lead them, which results in, of course, an election. And the funny thing is that all their election speeches? Still better than Trump. Alright, look, you want the truth? I don't want to be your leader. Being a leader totally sucks. It's hard work and you have to put up with people you hate. But I want to get my friends back, and seeing as that's our mission, I will deal with whatever bullshit I have to do to make it happen. And if I was holding a mic, this would be the part where i drop it. I vote for Tucker. Yeah, I vote for Tucker. Me too. Yeah. With that decided, the gang declares that if they can defeat Felix, they are ready to proceed with the mission. In any just and reasonable world, this would be a piece of cake, considering Felix is about as intimidating as a box of stale cornflakes, but this is the reds and blues we're talking about, so this ensues. <laughs> Helmet cams serve as the substitute for YouTube in the future. 
I mean, it's, it's basically the same thing. In an effort to try and soften the blow in a way that only Kimball can, which from what we've seen from her half-hearted motivational speeches is about as encouraging as a fart at a cocktail party, she takes Tucker to a lake filled with what I'm assuming is toxic waste, and instead of coming up with ideas that could help his special forces team, decides to go the complete opposite route and explain how she became the leader of the resistance. She also delves into Felix and Locus's backstory of being frontline grunts that became mercenaries for the added challenge. Why she felt he needed to know this information over how to actually lead a team is entirely beyond me, but I suspect it's because Felix's voice actor likes to stroke his own ego. I feel like this was supposed to be a bigger reveal than it actually was, but really the gist of it was something we could have easily figured out just from the few interactions we've seen between the two. Anyway, because Kimball literally did nothing to try and encourage them to be leaders, Tucker decides that the best thing to do is just to grab the resin blues and go off on their own. You know, like they've done for literally the entirety of their careers. Which I mean, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, they've stored a UNSC compound how many times? God knows they're probably more technologically advanced than these mooks. I can see it working. So these next couple scenes really don't do anything substantial except for introduce the space pirates, which I will admit are some of the cooler looking menus in the series and only slightly more competent than the resistant fighters from the freelancer seasons. They then make their way into the snow fortress with clever disguises. <laughs> but why snowman? Blah. Where are they hiding the carrots? I use the same trick to hide from Sarge all the time back in Blood Gulch. Hey, Sarge! I found him! It never snowed on Blood Gulch. Like, ever. This cutaway is stupid. They break their way into the facility and make their way to where the others are being captured, but to their surprise... Tucker? Wash? What in Sam hell are you boys doing here? We came to save you. But we were supposed to save you! Bob, bob, bob. Which I don't even get why this is a big revelation. I mean, is it so outside the realm of possibility that the feds would do to Wash's group what the New Republic did to Tucker's? I mean, they had to have heard the same story, that this was the group that took down Project Freelancer. I mean, isn't that why they sent Locus and his men? We then flash back to when Wash and the others were captured, and we get treated to this really weird dream sequence. I'll be honest, I've never really understood the purpose of this scene. It feels more like a dream sequence you should have seen last season, when Wash was clearly still suffering from his thoughts, not post-11 finale, when he seemed to have put that behind him. It should be for sure, feels like something Juan would have done, but it's a bit off. Well, if I can't beat off a room full of dudes, then what have I been training for this whole time? I'm just gonna let that line speak for itself. And here, we finally meet the terrifying leader of the Federal Army of Chorus, the cutting General Donald Doyle, the sinister, diabolical... You do oh Complete and utter chicken shit. This is the moment I started getting disappointed with this season, because they really let down on the idea of showing both armies being, well, average people and having a gray area as to which side was actually in the right. Hard to take this seriously when you've got a manipulative, posh general straight out of Dr. Evil's lair, and the ever-terrifying being ripped straight out of Predator. Still, it's missing something. That little extra bit of crazy mad to kind of round it all out. Now just take it easy for the rest of the day. Remember, you're no good to be dead. Although, I suppose I could run some experiments on your body. Ah yes, Hanji Zoe from Attack on Titan. Excellent. Now this is hell. So what we learned from this flashback? Both sides are in the shit, both sides have leaders down, and both sides are accusing the other of global domination. However, unlike the New Republic, where I can believe that they're the ones fighting for liberation because of the situation they're in, the lack of supplies and manpower they have, and the overall attitude of their command soldiers, the feds do literally everything in their power to make me believe that they are in the wrong. Everything about Doyle just oozes Governor Tarkin from Star Wars. They do feel like the evil empire. Every word he says sounds evil. There's nothing about this scene that convinces me that the feds are to be believed over the New Republic, or even that they're in the same situation. Agent Washington is referring to a Mantis-class military assault droid, and you won't find it among this wreckage. Okay, when you write a character like Locus, you know, the quiet, menacing, mysterious killer who lets his actions speak louder than his words and you never quite know what's going on in his head, there's a very fine line you walk as a writer to keep that illusion intact. This scene does everything it can to shatter that image completely. First of all, Locust talks way too fucking much in this scene, and from here on in, he's honestly about as much of a chatterbox as Felix is. No, I'm not kidding, they basically did to him what they did to Ren in Volume 3 of Ruby. Second, he gives way, way too much exposition here about his methods and his ideals. We don't need him to tell us all this. He can show us this, I have no problem with that, but we the audience are smart enough to understand him through show don't tell. 
I get that they really wanted to set up the similarity war between him and Wash, a plotline that unfortunately never really goes anywhere or does anything. But you can do that without going against everything we've built the character up to be. Anyway, the gang's back together, but as they're catching up, Locust decides this is the perfect time to obliterate all the feds in the area, which, since this happens immediately after the flashback episode, kind of further kills whatever they were trying to build up in regards to both sides being equal. But in a surprise entrance, Felix comes in to save the day. <sighs> that was close. Nice throw, Tucker. It turns out, surprise surprise, that Felix and Locus are actually working together with a group of space pirates to bring about the complete and total annihilation of the people of Chorus, and that the Civil War, although not of their initial doing, is being fueled by their actions in order to lead to that goal. Here now is a good time to discuss Miles Luna as a writer. Now to start with, I think Miles is at his best when he writes character moments and interactions. He manages, seemingly without even trying, to bring about that emotional response needed to sell a deep moment. He has an effective way of making the audience feel that emotional connection to the characters. That scene with Carolina in New York's diary? Yeah, that was him. And that great moment between Yang and Blake in the classroom? That was a beautiful one, right? When it comes to doing those character moments, he's positively brilliant with it. As a story writer, on the other hand, well, let's just say he suffers from a severe case of Moffat Syndrome, and for those of you who don't follow British television, or at the very least have never browsed Tumblr on a somewhat frequent basis, Stephen Moffat is the creator and lead writer for the hit show Sherlock, as well as the current showrunner for Doctor Who, although his tenure is coming to an end in the near future. Moffat's storylines are known to be riddled with plot holes and have these huge mysteries that build up and build up only to fizzle out instead of have a satisfying payoff. Stop me if any of this sounds familiar. Miles' problem also stems from the fact that his plot twists are predictable, incredibly so. Pretty much everyone and their mother knew Blake was a faunist months before she removed her bow, and I defy you to find a single person who didn't know Penny was a robot from her first appearance. I mean, fuck, people were calling Pyrrha's death by episode 5. Granted, I still don't think she's gonna stay dead, but I digress. And here's the same. People saw this coming. There was discussion for weeks about how Felix was gonna turn out to be a traitor. So by the time it happened, it was more disappointing than anything else. And again, harkening back to what I said during Ruby 3, we know what they're trying to do, we don't really know why. Or rather, the only why we have is money. That's it. And there's no angle I can see where the ends justify the means in this case. What amount is worth committing genocide on an entire planet's population? And why does this employer need to kill everyone? Why can't he just come down and grab what he needs, whatever it is? This plan is not just irrational, and it's insulting to anyone trying to find the logic of it. What is worth enacting Third Reich level of a final solution on a planet of people that, on first glance, seems to be just another space colony? Like, these people aren't a threat to the universe, hell, they're barely a threat to each other, there's no point. Not only is the writing completely predictable and entirely nonsensical, Miles just essentially fucked his own premise in the ass. Remember, the war on Chorus was supposed to represent the gray area of war, with no side being black or white. The problem is that Felix and Locust are both so transparently evil that it completely kills all notion of that. They are the villains, their entire purpose is to kill the entire planet. Why? Because money. There's no gray area there. That is about as Victor Von Doom level of evil as you can possibly get. Also, this flashback sequence is clearly meant to evoke feelings of the plot twist of Reconstruction, but here's why it completely fails. In Reconstruction, the big twist was that Church was actually an AI, but more than that, he was the God AI. It took a character that the audience knew and loved for over half a decade and cranked him up to 11. And it wasn't just a character reveal, this scene changed Red vs. Blue. It propelled the show to a whole new level of story that no one expected of it. It was one of the most shocking reveals in visual media, one of the most beautifully crafted reveals ever shown. Now cut to this scene and like, god, it's all done wrong. First, who the fuck are Felix and Locus? They're two street rats pulled off the front line suffering clear signs of PTSD and making a living killing people. We've known them for what, an hour of this show's 12 plus hour runtime? Whoopty shit. Who the fuck cares about Felix and Locus? Second, what are we really learning here? That Locus is in fact as evil as he looks and acts? That Felix really is as big an asshole as he's always said he is? Fuck a doodle do. Felix is right, they never did lie, they are every bit the pieces of shit they portray themselves as. And all that we really learned from this scene is that the Reds and Blues are indeed idiots for believing they were on the level. Final note, this line? Back off. Control wants them alive. Oh no. Yeah, that oh no makes zero sense in context. First off, you can't just add that radio clip in when we clearly didn't hear it last season. Second, who the fuck is he saying oh no to? Us? We don't know what's going on at that point. Himself? Why? Isn't that what he wants? Locust because it's competition? I thought he reveled in the competition. 
Somebody help me? Why does he say oh no? No one will find your bodies. No one will know the truth. And no one is going to stop us from killing every last person on this planet. All right. That's all I need to hear. Well, gee, who didn't see that coming? I mean, with a build-up like that. So this is the first proper fight scene we get this season, and it's... Yeah, this is it. In fact, I haven't even really talked about the animation for this season yet, even though it's been present in just about every episode, and it's the biggest change they added to the chorus arc so far. As far as regular movement goes, I actually kind of like how they did it. Characters move more realistically now, and it actually feels more natural than Monty's animation in the past, including the Freelancer seasons. As far as the fight choreography, however, it, um... How do I put this gently? It sucks. This fight here is about as dull as watching C-SPAN and about as uninteresting as watching snails fuck. In an attempt to go for realism, they took out all the pizzazz, all the style, everything that made the action scenes of Red vs. Blue so epic. This fight is just balls. And unfortunately, right here is where the writers really drop the ball on the villains. Felix becomes a whiny, insufferable man-child with about as much usefulness to society as a used condom wrapper. And Locus, well, sadly, Locus loses just about everything that made him cool and terrifying. Just the idea that he's the straight man to this annoying cunt creature's fool, and that he basically spends the rest of the trilogy bantering back and forth with him, just removes everything they were setting up with him. Separately, they were cool characters with compelling personalities and rich backstories and were able to keep the audience interest. Together, they're about as physically and psychologically threatening as Team Rocket. Anyway, they escape, and Caroline and Church are reunited with their friends. whoop de doo We then go to another flashback episode. Seriously, two flashback episodes in the span of three episodes? What is this, Lost? That shows what Caroline and Church were up to when all this went down. Sort of. Something of interest to note is that this is the first episode since 10 that Bernie wrote, so if you notice the change in quality, that's why. It's got that classic RVB feel to it that harkens back to the old Blood Gulch days. And what I also like about this episode is that this is probably the most in control of a situation Church has ever been, the most confident we've ever seen him. Think of how Epsilon was in Recreation Revelation and compare him to right now. That's a hell of a transformation. Okay, Carolina, how's your aim? She hasn't been sleeping well. She's been having bad dreams about the bad guy. Oh, Carolina's suffering Sigma nightmares? Oh, what an interesting plotline that we will literally never mention ever again. Okay, I mean, I wasn't exactly expecting Elijah Wood to make a full-on comeback here, but why even mention that line if you're not going to do anything with it? My only guess is that it's to explain why Carolina sucks so much this season. But I'll get to that. And we see where Carolina got her new helmet. Even though we clearly saw her wearing it at the end of 10, but I digress. Also, is that recon armor? Why well, you had to sell an arm, a leg, and a kidney to get recon in Halo? So now the whole gang is back together, Carolina gives us the massive exposition dump in regards to how their crash on course was no accident. There is a lot of exposition given in these next few episodes. And all of it, it basically can be summed up the exact same way. We have no idea who is funding this or why they want this done. But they do find out that the pirates have been taking broken alien technology and been activating them to be used weaponry. Realizing that it's the same kind of technology as the teleportation cues from their ship, Carolina and Church decide to go back to the crash sites and secure the ship manifest in order to see exactly what they're dealing with. Alpha's another story. We've acquired its coordinates for teleportation. Oh, okay, so apparently the teleportation cues can be programmed to teleport to a specific location based on the coordinates put in. So the reason Doc couldn't come back is because he didn't set the proper coordinates? How does that even work? How do you even set the coordinates? I don't see a keypad anywhere on them. So they split up into two teams. One goes back to the canyon from last season to get the ship manifest, and the other goes to the other half of the ship that disappeared on impact to also get the manifest. Well, I guess that makes sense. Who knows which end of the ship it ended up in. Tucker's group ends up in some canyon with a bunch of destroyed alien ships. Callback? Foreshadow? Does anybody honestly still care about the Great Prophecy at this point? Church tries to hack into it, but the space pirates find them, and Tucker, who is clearly suffering PTSD after the last time this situation happened, and really with how that scene played out, who wouldn't, pulls the plug too early and they fall back with a plus one on board. Oh, uh-huh, yeah, okay. Shot in the head, bullet through the chest, nuts crushed on a concrete barricade at high velocity, those we can walk away from no problem. One tiny little knife prick to the leg, and suddenly we're down our best freelancer. Yeah, that makes total sense. Fuck you. Ever since that pirate guy regained consciousness, Caroline has been trying to get info out of him, but so far nothing's working. So you need help with the interrogation? Actually, we were hoping you could calm down Carolina. 
Why won't he talk? She's a little frustrated. Did the director not put the freelancers through any kind of interrogation training? I mean, come on, all those classroom lessons, all those training exercises, and they can't even t intimidate this low-level thug? Do you know where we are? Huh? This is a remote research facility designed to study the surrounding wildlife. I volunteered at one just like it in grad school. It's got a laboratory, an incinerator, and oodles of state-of-the-art surgical equipment. Would you like to see them? <laughs> Sarge? I'm scared. Simmons? We're all scared. You are not even trying to hide the fact that you blatantly ripped this character off from Attack on Titan, are you? How has nobody called them on this? The guy basically confirms everything that we, the audience, already figured out. Really, it feels like they just keep reiterating the same points over and over. Or maybe I'm just smarter than the average viewer and can call this shit more easily than others. Or maybe I just watch too many movies. Or maybe who gives a fuck, this explanation is just more reiterating. The space pirates show up again and kill their captive. Wash realizes that they've been tracking them through Fre Freckles' CPU. Oh yeah, by the way, Freckles was destroyed in that big battle at the end of last season, but uh, Locust, for whatever reason, saved the CPU and gave it to Wash. I mean, I get the idea that they need to have a tracking device on him, but I don't understand why bother using Freckles. Like, why do they keep trying to shoehorn Freckles in? I mean, you can run seasons 12 and 13 without him, and they work perfectly fine. So, I don't know. They have some kind of weird boner for this robot. Would you guys all shut up? This isn't helping. Oh, yeah, right. Since when have you managed to help out around here? Hey, maybe you haven't noticed, but I've kind of been running this shit while you were gone. Oh, yeah, there's this whole subplot about Tucker and Church and how Tucker's being pissy because Church came back without apologizing for banning them, and I just... I don't know, this whole plot line just seems forced. Yeah, Church leaving them affected Tucker, but he spent most of last season just being pissy at Wash, not Church. The storyline feels like it would have fit Caboose more than Tucker, given everything that happened last season. Actually, it probably would have done more good, given Caboose didn't really have an arc this season, and Tucker had, like, four. Okay, Tucker. I'm gonna tell you this only because you respect my opinion so much. If you keep being mean to Church, Church will just keep being mean to you. And then, everyone will be mean to everyone all the time, and everything will be bad, and no one will have fun. I mean, come on! Is this really what you want? You just... You just want to be angry and mean all the time? Because that is dumb! And you know what? You are not more thinking that! Some church left! And maybe some of us were sad! But you know what? That is okay! Because he was just trying to do something good! And he just made a mistake! And we all make mistakes sometimes! Wow. Caboose, I... So shut up and get over it! I can't tell if I like this rant or not. On the one hand, it's probably the most coherent that Caboose has ever been, which isn't really saying much. But on the other hand, Caboose is really mean in this rant. Like, Caboose is not a mean character, even if it is Tucker. Like, it just feels really out of character. No, it's just... It feels like every choice I make is the worst. Here now is a good place to talk about Tucker, and if there's one thing I can praise Chorus for, it is how far Tucker's character has come. Of the original cast, save Church and Tex due to freelancer reasons, Tucker has grown the most out of all of the Blood Gulch crew, and he has easily shown the progression naturally through the entire show. Think back to when we first met him in Blood Gulch. He was a lazy, perverted dude who felt like a third wheel to everything that was going on. Of the original Blues, he was the one that left the least impact next to Church's personality and plot importance, and Caboose being the lovable, dumb puppy that he is. Then there was that whole conspiracy, Red and Blues are the same bit, where he finally got a storyline to himself, finally got something to do even if it was just to stay alive. Then he found the sword, and suddenly he was this hero. He was the one who was to prevent the Great Destroyer. Yeah, that prophecy was pretty bullshit, but you start to see him really evolve as a fighter. He starts to become more combat effective. In the Recollections trilogy, we see him as an ambassador for the Human Alien Alliance. Yeah, the book proved it was pretty bullshit, but you know what? Fuck the book. Because it's Tucker taking responsibility. It's him stepping up to the plate and being some kind of a leader. And while it never really goes anywhere, you have to admire him taking that job. And now in Chorus, we see him having to come to the realization that, you know what? War really does suck, and he has to make decisions that might get soldiers killed, and he's struggling to find that balance of accepting that and fighting to keep the casualties at a minimum. Tucker went from being a backup character to the stuff of soldier legend over the course of 12 years. You have to be completely blind not to see that he has been evolving this entire time, cultivating into the person we see in Chorus, who is now the first one into battle, sort of blazing. 
It's a huge development from how he started, and this kind of fits into what I've been trying to point out this whole time. It is okay for things to evolve. After 12 years, these characters have earned the right to grow up. And I don't agree with this mentality that because it's a comedy that they need to be stuck in the same personalities always. Let them grow. Let them mature. Tucker can still make terrible sexist jokes, but his experiences can still change him as a person. Just find the balance for Christ's sakes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking, and boy, have I got some news for you. In other news, Felix can go suck a railroad spike. Yeah, so while all this has been going on, the Mercs have decided the only way to keep their cover is just to have one final push in the capital between the two warring armies to wipe each other out. And then they do the totally smart thing and call the Reds and Blues to tell them everything that's going to happen, and taunt them into believing they failed. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say the smart thing? I mean, they did the one thing that basically ensures that they're going to lose. I'm leaving to track them down. Wait, no, no, no! You, you can't just leave. What about the, uh, the impending battle? So, Gray's basically having a conversation with himself right here, right? Just wondering. Seriously, have they never watched an action movie in their lives? The one thing that basically guarantees that the heroes are going to come and stop you is by taunting them and telling them your exact plan. You might as well just drop your pants and spread your ass cheeks while you're at it. Who hired these Nimrods and why did they think this was a good idea? The clock counting down to the final battle, the team goes over their options. Option A. We can take our last teleportation grenade and jump to a place on Chorus where we can lay low for a while. The obvious con here is that the armies will probably blow each other to bits. We lose Chorus, but still have the chance to bring down control and walk away from this alive. That gets us two out of three. What's option B? If, and let me tell you, I cannot stress this if hard enough, if Locus and Felix are telling the truth, we go back to the canyon, get on the ship, go home. What about option C? <sighs> teleport to the radio jammer. If we take out their defenses and shut down the machine, and if we're not too late, then we can broadcast a message to the capital. There's a fourth option. Carolina and I go on the run with Epsilon and do our best to bring down control. And the rest of you take the ship and go home. Hmm, this is tricky. Oh, you know what? I think I actually have a perfect solution. You have two of the strongest freelancers in the universe on your side. Kick their fucking door down, stick the barrel of a shotgun up their ass, and launch their heads into the fucking stratosphere! I'm sorry, but in a history of evil doing that includes Omega, Gamma, Wyoming, the Cultist, the Meta, the Director, Fake CT, the Insurrectionists, an army of Tex robots, and the entire UNSC military, you mean to tell me that these two are the ones that are gonna take us down? The fucking Seth Rogen and James Franco of Villainous duos, would you ever be able to live with yourself knowing that these two were the ones that stopped you from saving the world? If that happened to me, I wouldn't even give them the satisfaction of killing me. I'd just slip my own wrists and get it over with because I'd be so fucking embarrassed. Do you really expect me to believe that of all the foes they have faced, and all the ass they have kicked, that the only thing stopping them from saving an entire planet, that is somehow, don't ask me how, considered to be the only legitimate threat to them, is Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway and Arnie fucking Grape? This isn't a fucking question, guys! Line these fuckers up against the wall and put a fucking bullet in their heads! And of course they're gonna stay and try and save everyone, because the show would pretty much be over if they just abandoned the planet to their doom. So while the feds in the New Republic duke it out in the capital, which is called Armonia, which sounds like something you wouldn't want to inhale, the Reds and Blues take on the Space Pirates. Need signature detected. Did that gun just fucking talk? Firing main cannon. How did they know that a Mantis CPU would work with an assault rifle? Like, did the soldiers just regularly put AIs in their weapon? Especially from, like, heavy artillery? Get him! Ah! Okay, I'll admit, that sequence is pretty funny. Oh, come on, this is just embarrassing. You're freelancers, goddammit. You're getting your asses kicked by Lucy from Elf and Lead and the aborted love child of Gary Busey. The Sim Troopers are doing their jobs better than you. The fucking Sim Troopers are doing their jobs better than you. I just can't believe this. Carolina can't do a damn thing to them. What happened between RBB10 and now that reduced Carolina from the number one freelancer to someone who can't even throw a good punch? The only logical conclusion I can come to is that since the ship crashed, she and Wash just haven't been working out as much. Oh, bullshit. Okay, let's compare the two hero versus villain dynamics here. 
Throughout this season, they're trying to impose the idea that Locust is Washington's darker half, but the two ideologies don't really clash. Wash followed orders because he believed he was striving towards a greater good, i.e. winning the war and saving humanity. Yeah, he was wrong, and yeah, his later years were more for himself, but he was a soldier striving for a better tomorrow. Locust hides behind following orders to excuse himself doing terrible things. He knows what he's doing is terrible, that it doesn't benefit anyone but his one employer who is clearly a raging psychopath for wanting this done. The perfect soldier bullshit doesn't really apply when your objective is mass genocide, unless you're a Nazi, which, let's be fair, he'd fit right in with them. You really can't compare the two. Wash never slaughtered cities full of innocents. Wash never blew a baby up or anything like that, whereas I'm fairly sure Locust has a necklace of baby skulls somewhere in his apartment. Just not easy to make the comparison, because Locust is like chaotic evil and Wash is more true neutral to chaotic neutral. Now let's look at Tucker and Felix, and this one is a little easier to define. Both are cynical soldiers who don't entirely believe in their cause. However, Tucker fights despite the hopelessness, whereas Felix accepts it and is in fact the cause of it. He embraces the futility of these actions, while Tucker fights against that futility. In this, there's a clear parallel, and it's another way to showcase how Tucker has grown over the years, even if he has to share that parallel with such a whiny, obnoxious waste of living space like Felix. And okay, I admit, my hatred of Felix is not entirely irrational, I do have my reasons. You see, when Felix was introduced, I actually didn't mind the character all that much. He was this kinda douchey, kinda egotistical merc who happened to be fighting for the good side, if you could call it that. He had an edge to him that you really couldn't put your finger on. His interactions with Tucker are interesting, and I think Tucker even looked up to him in a loathing sort of way. He's not fully good and not fully evil, he's got a healthy balance. He's a character who really could go either way and it would work. At first. The problem is that once the reveal happens, he loses all of that. He stops being multifaceted, he stops having that gray area, he just becomes a one-dimensional villain straight out of a kid's cartoon. It's the one note that he hits constantly, the note of wahaha, I'm clearly evil and a douchebag. The more the show goes in this direction with him, the less interested I am in him as a character. To the point where, if he's going to insist on acting like a child, I'm going to insist on treating him like one. Like, compare him to the director, who committed heinous crimes stemming from his sorrow of losing his wife, or the meta, who fought to stay human as he was losing his identity and humanity. And yeah, okay, O'Malley was the kind of cartoon villain you'd see in a Disney movie, but given everything that we've learned about the AI since O'Malley left the show, it adds so much depth to him. Felix doesn't have that. It's an incredibly odd case where his fake persona is more of an interesting character than the person he actually is. In short, they dropped the ball so hard on Felix that the ball fell into another metaphor. And right here is the destruction of any hopes of a redemption arc for this character. He is doomed to be a terrible character that he is. And god, poor Tucker for, for taking a knife wound like that. Like, that's really gonna set him back. Um, you know what probably could have helped him, though? Is it, It's really kind of, a, you know, out there kind of idea, but if only he had this thing where his armor, like, locked up and, and prevented him from getting any serious wounds. But the fuck I know where we're gonna find something like that in a place like this! What do you think, Church? Yeah. This guy's got no idea what he's talking about. What the, what the fuck is this? Oh, this is Church. He's the AI that helps me run my equipment. What equipment? My helmet cam. Oh! Somebody just got. Wait! Whoa! 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 You mean to tell me that they had those helmet cams on them the entire time, and they only just now started recording things? Those cameras should have been on from the minute they left the New Republic base. I mean, hell, th those cameras could have broken the entire last half of the season. But what the fuck? Oh, hey, look, the heroes outsmarted the bad guys, stopped the war, and saved the day. Who could have seen that one coming? They are injured. We can kill them now. No. We follow orders. Let me assure you all, this is not over. Dude, why are you taunting them and basically ensuring that they're going to keep coming after you? Because, hey, if they keep coming after you, they can stop you. You know, like they just fucking did? So with everything now laid out in the open, the Feds and the New Republic agree to a temporary truce and all move into Armonia, where the chances of soldiers being found accidentally murdered in bar fights now spikes to an all-time high. I mean, I get it, it's the obvious logical move to make, but maybe we should do some couples counseling first or something. Uh, very well then. Uh, in honor of your service, I hereby promote you to Colonel... Uh, Sarge. How do we still not know Sarge's real name? Like, it's been 12 years. 
you'd think someone would have figured it out by now. I thought the plan was to distract Locus, not let him mop the floor with you. Look, they were better than I expected, okay? No, this, my dear, is what we call a complete ass-kicking. God, they nerfed Carolina so hard this season. Like, she was the most useless character. In, in fact, yeah, she literally was the most useless character. Everyone else had done a better job managing this season than her. Wow, they say Miles is less sexist than Bernie. Jesus. Anyway, Church finally cracks the manifest and discovers that the equipment on the ship can be traced back to Charon Industries, the umbrella corporation of this universe that also funded the resistance from the freelancer years. It's funny when you actually go back to those seasons and see the Charon name painted here and there in the background. I mean, I know they didn't plan on it, but it was pretty clever foreshadowing. I'm at a loss, gentlemen. Years of arduous labor and delicate manipulation all made worthless by your inability to stop a single squad of what can hardly be considered soldiers. Why do we still bother underestimating the reds and blues at this point when they have taken on literal godlike humans before and won? Like, what makes the mercs think they can succeed where other more legitimate and quite frankly better trained soldiers have failed? Hello? Yes? Hello? What is this? Extra sauce, please! An outside transmission. Hello? How'd they get this channel? Don't you maintain a hold on all the radio frequencies? Isn't that what they said earlier? They've got some sort of radio jammer set up that only allow broadcasting on certain frequencies. And they monitor all other open channels. So it really couldn't have been that hard. It's easy to find someone on the radio when they're literally all over the radio. The Red and Blue Troopers of Project Freelancer receive a full pardon from UNSC Oversight Chairman and Caron Industries CEO Malcolm Hargrove. I can't imagine you like publicizing that second bit very much, though. Probably not very good for business. Am I right, Chairman? It turns out, surprise, surprise, that the Chairman of the UNSC was behind everything. The ship crashing, the mercenaries, and even the resistance from the freelancer years. Malcolm Hargrove, the man who for so long was about rules and regulations and keeping a natural order of things, turns out to be the biggest hypocrite in the RVB universe as he uses his army of space pirates to, you guessed it, try and take over the planet Chorus. Of course! I've always wanted to use that gag in a video. <laughs> I like how they ended on this speech because it's a callback to Reconstruction, but also because of how negative this entire situation has been. Now it finally feels like we're back on top. The mercs are not the ones in charge anymore, and now they're the ones who are going to be running. I like it for no reason other than I get to laugh at Felix's stupid fucking face. There's absolutely no way they're going to come back from- And, Phyllis? Could you verify that Locus's delivery was sent to the trophy room? The crate from the shipwreck was unloaded and delivered this morning, sir. Wonderful. I could use a bit of good news today. If I had to pick a best season of the Chorus Trilogy, and that's not exactly a high bar endorsement, but I'd have to go with 12 being the best. The first several episodes are good, and I really like what they did with Tucker's character and his evolution into a somewhat more mature adult. The problem is that once the reveal happens, the plot just completely shits the bed. I mean, they didn't even attempt to address the gray area of war, and that was the whole selling point going into the season. The plot is as cookie cutter as it can get, save the world, stop the clearly evil bad guys, win the day. And in an attempt to make the CGI more realistic, they made the action scenes more boring. It's a case of one step forward, two steps backwards thing. But hey, it was a step in the right direction, and next season is the final season for this trilogy. And I have complete and utter confidence in the writers, the animators, and all else, that there is absolutely no way that they could do anything to fuck this up.
He is a general award on the cock of R.E.B. culture. Hughes and Lindelof look at him and suddenly don't feel bad about writing Paolo and Nikki into Lost. The law from video game high school had more credibility than this jack-off. I hate him so much, I'd rather- Hey, everyone took Nikki. He's gone too far this Why don't you go and make sure he sees it? R.